<laughs> I see there's no clock in here, right? So I'll try to keep time. I'll stay on time. Okay. Uh, is there, there's a lot of new faces, yes? Right? No? Because I don't... Or maybe they just decided to show up this time? Is that All right. So I was asked to commit this next half an hour to mental health. Anybody mental here? To, no, I'm kidding. Mental health is, is a broad, broad spectrum of information. But I'm going to distill something down and apply it to you. <clears throat> so today's theme, simply, how do you turn pain into power? Will that work? Will that work for you? I'm sure somebody's been in either physical or emotional pain at some point, maybe even right this moment. Now, I don't know, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Spencer Barron. I'm the chiropractor that's on the sports medicine staff here. And I've seen a lot of you over the years. So hopefully th what I'm going to share with you will resonate because what it's about is giving you some tools, simply. So let me start with a little story. You're probably going to be bored to death, but I'm going to add a little culture to this experience and share with you what I'm going to, a, a two minute video. You'll probably suffer through it, but just understand where this is going. There was an opera that was done <clears throat> it was a performance that was created back in 1834. So nothing that we can all relate to back then. But the message was about a character. Now, have, have you all heard of the opera singer Luciano Pavarotti? He, this was in our lifetime the greatest tenor that ever lived. Thank you. Right? <laughs> Has anybody heard of Lil Wayne? No, kidding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Wait, right, we got a dichotomy going on here. But anyway, point is simple. Luciano Pavarotti is, is the singer in this. He is simply, he passed away several years ago, but one of the greatest tenors of all time. Now, he plays in this performance called Pagliacci. Now, Pagliacci is about a clown. So he plays this guy named Can Canio. And Canio is a clown that dresses up and makes people laugh and creates this spell of happiness for all of them. But something ironic happened the night of one of the biggest performances. You will see, as, as Pavarotti acts, Canio's life out. And by the way, it's in Italian, and if none of you are Italian here. I have no idea what he's saying, but the theme of the song is Vesti La Juba, and it's about putting the mask on. Okay? The mask. What happens right before Canio goes on stage is that he finds out that his wife ran off with his best friend. In today's era, we would go out and pop a cap in this guy. But back then, the emotions. So he's speaking of the irony behind the fact that he has to entertain people and yet he's f feeling the most exquisite pain in his entire life. In Italian, that's putting on the costume, Vesti La Juba, putting on the mask or the costume which is symbolic of a lot of things for you.
So now he has to apply the makeup and put the mask or the costume on and act like he's happy. My point is trying to make an effort in not only exposing you to some, some classic culture, but also to exhibit one of the, this is one of the greatest performances ever. And the point being is, how many of you can actually experience that kind of excruciating emotional pain and go on and be number one? in your event. So how can you do that? Is by translating that emotional anguish into power, into personal power. Now, if you don't know how to do that, I'm going to share five steps of what grief is, what the transitions through grief is about. And it's simple, it's stuff that you can, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the phases you've all been through, sometimes you miss a phase or two. But for those of you who experience that moment of grief, well, and grief can come in many different ways. It can come, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you can lose somebody in your life, whether it be a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a loved one, um, uh, or, you know, an animal or a pet or, or an experience um, being the last one in a race because you've, you're injured or not even competing. And I've seen it many, many times. For those of you who don't know, I worked with Miami Dolphins for 19 years. And boy, you see a lot. You see a lot of stuff that people go, why me? Why me? This was my year and yet they come back and they do extraordinarily well. I had an experience, before I go into those five phases, I had an experience that I'll never forget. I had to be at Miami Dolphins at 6.30 a.m. Every morning, that was my time. And I would have to take care of a bunch of, a bunch of guys that were three and four times my size. But that's what I did. I truly believe one of the reasons why I was there and then worked with the Florida Marlins, or well, the Miami Marlins and then the Panthers and all that is because of my character. You have to rise above your junk to solve other people's stuff. What do I mean by that? To rise above that, whatever you're experiencing, to go above and beyond that and act as if you're happy or you have the mask on. So I had to be there. And typically my routine was I had to walk my dogs. I had three dogs. My family was in California at the time. So here I am at four o'clock in the morning walking my three dogs. <clears throat> Some I would let off the leash and they would follow. I am five houses away from being back at my house. I see my neighbor who has a history of drinking a little much. <clears throat> she runs over my 35 pound toy fox terrier in front of me. The other two dogs are over here and I see this one and she was only going, the driver was going three, four miles an hour. I watch everything in slow motion happen and there's nothing I can do. Not only was there nothing I can do, sorry if I spit on you, <laughs> but in an hour and a half, I had to be at Miami Dolphins with a smiley face on. I had to pick up the dog who took her last breath in my arms, carry my dog, and and be responsive to the driver who was also an emotional wreck and let her know it was an accident, it's okay. And carry the dog back to my house, bury the dog, shower, change, 
and be at Miami Dolphins, and nobody knew. That was daring. Because how many of you would have called and said, I can't make it today? How many of you would have made it, and those guys would have asked, hey, you seem off today. Not one person said, in fact, this is how you know you rise above that level of paradox, that confusion, that state of grief is when you go, when they turn to you and go, man, you're fired up today. What's up? I want to take what you're taking. I go, if you only knew. So, Vesti Lajuba, put on the uniform, put on the mask. Because eventually you will become what you think. If you act positive, you will become positive. Simple. Let's go through the five phases. Does anybody know what the five phases of grief are? The first one. Who said that? Nice. Denial. Do you know what denial looks like? Do you know what that seems like? What's that? Den <laughs> oh, that is denial. Right. Very good. Very good. <laughs> so, the moment the event strikes you, whatever it may be, you go, what? There's no way. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> you can eat. Oh, you did already. No, there's denial is when you actually go into a state where this didn't really happen. No way. There's no way. How could this have happened? Right? What's the second one? The second phase. Come on, come on. Phase two of grief, stage two is, come on, you've all experienced it. That's it, anger. How many of you get so aggravated? Now, there's different levels, uh, levels of aggravation. You get so angry that you, your face turns red, you, you stomp on the floor. There is actually a level of anger that I hope you never experience. And it's a phenomenon called a neural hijacking. That is where you've heard people go blind. It's a blind rage. Has anybody ever experienced that? Or care to admit that? I have been there. I have been in a blind rage where people don't know what they do at that point. That's the extreme. That's a neural hijacking. But everybody else is just angry. Anger. So, denial. Anger. <laughs> you want to try the third? Not yet. But thanks. Bargaining. Right? You know what bargaining looks like? Bargaining looks like, why didn't you take me, God, instead of my whatever? I hate using my family because that's someone's, sounds bad. But what if I would have done this? Maybe this wouldn't have happened. What if I would have done that? That's bargaining. You're bargaining with something out in space that might change the outcome, but it's real. Want to try number three or four? Not yet. <laughs> well, who said that? Air, fist, bump, good, okay. Depression. You walk around mopey. You bury your head in the pillow. Everybody has a very interesting and quirky way of exhibiting depression. But depression is a fascinating phenomenon because sometimes we don't even know we're in it. Depression can be a sequence of things, or it could, excuse me, depression could be the end result of a sequence of things. You could trip over a curve. I was actually, I didn't even know this. I was talking to um, the uh, psychologist to the Miami Dolphins when we went 0-16. You want to talk about depression because these guys
to walk around the streets without someone going, you suck. Oh, I didn't mean it to pay. Point. I, you suck. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I didn't mean to pick on you. That way. But the, um, and he was telling us, he goes, I go, what is depression? Because these, some of these guys seem like, the, depression is like a sequence of, you lose one game, you're walking to the store, you trip over to the curb, you get pissed off at the curb, you walk and you try to open the door, the door's locked. And so there's a sequence of things that mount that get you to that point. So, now, the last and final stage. Realization or acceptance. Thank you. I'll, I'll t- say that again. I'm on fire. You are on fire. <laughs> That's great. Acceptance. You finally go, all right, I'm good with this. And hopefully, and the most important part of this, is you look for a positive outcome. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But my son, for those of you who know Hunter, Hunter, Hunter is, uh, you know, Mr. Neurosport, a leader guy, if you've seen it. Okay. <laughs> he told me a story the other day that he had listened to that I thought was appropriate for this. It just happened that we merged our thoughts. And go ahead. Let's share here. Here, you can, you can yeah. since we're, we're uh, videotaping, you've know, right, you got to stand right. <laughs> So there was a man named Eric, and he was on a walk with his dog named Nova. And during the walk, Nova sees a rabbit jump out of a bush and darts after the rabbit. Um, Eric goes on to chase Nova, which only uh, makes Nova want to run faster. Um, By the time uh, Eric starts chasing Nova, and then the rabbit is off somewhere hidden, he doesn't know and um, Dog Nova is lost. Eric spends all day looking for Nova. He's putting up posters, signs. He's calling his friends, his family, his neighbors, but still nothing. So Eric begin, he, he feels like the most unlucky man right now. He said, why him? Why in that moment did that rabbit have to jump out? Why was I um, in that moment at that exact time when the rabbit jumped out? And and um, he just feels like the most unlucky guy right now. So about a week goes by and he gets a knock on his door. It's a woman and she has Nova and they reconnect in the most affectionate way possible. <coughs> and after the, the woman greets Eric, she says, oh, my name's Vanessa, beautiful woman and around Eric's age. And they continue talking and so, um, continue talking and Eric asks Vanessa out on a date and so they they continue talking and eventually they start dating and Eric is just so he he thinks she's beautiful funny nice sweet everything she's just absolutely perfect for for Eric and eventually they fall in love so Eric is feeling like man I feel like the man right now he's uh, he's like the luckiest guy in the world and so um, he's so lucky that Vanessa was in the right moment at the right time um, to find Nova and bring him back to Eric. About a month goes by. Eric is on his way to go pick up Vanessa. Um, he's at an intersection. Light turns green. He proceeds. Boom! He gets smacked from the side by someone who, didn't, uh, who was distracted. He didn't see the red light. Eric is rushed to the hospital. He wakes up about an hour later. Doctor comes in. He says he explains what's going on. He says Eric, you suffered from uh, you have a serious head injury. We're gonna run some brain scans immediately. See if we have any internal bleeding, or per- or even permanent brain damage. So man, Eric is thinking, why me? Why why did I have to be in that exact moment, that exact time, going to pick up Vanessa? And he feels really frustrated because of something he could have changed so, he could have easily changed, and now it's potentially costing him his life. The next morning he wakes up, the doctor comes in, he says, the doctor says, Eric, we have some good news and we have some bad news. He says, all right, let me hear the bad news first. He says, well, they're kind of the same thing. Eric gets a little confused. 
The doctor goes on to explain. He says, Eric, it appears we found a glioma in your brain. Eric has no idea what that is. The doctor goes on to elaborate. He says, a glioma is a brain tumor. They found a brain tumor in his brain, but it's not, it wasn't caused from the accident. He says, normally, when we find these brain tumors, it's when patients begin to start feeling symptoms, and um, by that point, it's almost always too late. The doctor says, we should be able to do surgery and remove the brain tumor with no problem. The doctor tells Eric, in a weird way, this car accident basically saved your life. Eric is flooded with all types of emotions. He feels a little disoriented. And he thinks, he thinks, how can something so bad turn out to be something so good at the same time? And um, he thinks um, that Sorry. Um, every little thing, whether it's every every little small negative thing that happens in life, happens for an even greater reason. He sits back and thinks, "Man, I am so lucky to have ever been in that car accident. I am so lucky to have ever met Vanessa, and I'm especially lucky to have ever lost my dog Nova." And. He thinks back to the time when, when he lost Nova. He, he thinks, man, it feels like, like the end, of the, the absolute end of the world because he lost his dog. When, when in reality, it saved his world. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. So, just another story of many that allows you to realize that sometimes when negative things happen you can find the silver lining. The silver lining, it's hard to find because if you're not hardwired to figure it out, you might not see it. Because those are the things that, that is in the fabric of your being. For those of you who experience negative things and walk around going, you know, that's just my luck, or it is just what happens to me. Or if something positive happens, you go, you know, my life's pretty crappy. It'll probably be followed by something negative because that's the balance of life, homeostasis. So if something good happens, something bad has to happen. That's pretty whacked, isn't it? Well, I'm a testimony to actually believing that at some point in my life. There were some points in my life that you just question your existence on the planet. So, let's see. When I was in high school, I was a wrestler in high school, and life was good. I actually did quite well. My 11th grade year, I thought, I'm going to go into a preseason tournament because I'm varsity now. I'm going to do well. I'm expected to go to state. Everything's going to be perfect. So I go into a preseason tournament, and I wrestle a guy that wasn't that great. I had him beat. Something happened because he was so awkward and not very smooth. I got crossed up somehow. He pulled my neck and I heard three pops in my neck. I kind of shrugged it off. Coach says, hey, it's not that important of tournament. Do you want to continue? And I said, I do, coach. I got this guy. I go back in for the second of three minutes and we end up Somehow, I cross up, I land on my head, and hear popping sounds that you don't ever want to hear in your neck. I laid there, everybody gathered around, asked if I could move body parts. I was able to. And you know, it was interesting, because they said, all right, we're not going to take you to the hospital, because you can move. So I went home. And dear old mom, as you would expect, takes the pillow, the hot pack, and, or the, the heater, and, you know, make sure I'm okay. Dad checks in on me. By the next morning, I was in the most remarkable pain in my life. 
I could still move body parts, but obviously now that I understand what went on, the joint swelled, the injury created more pain, and the heat made everything worse. Thanks, Mom. Anyway, I ended up in the hospital. I ended up in the hospital. They didn't know what was wrong, which was scary. They took x-rays. They didn't see any fractures. They said something that I realize now that it was ridiculous. They said, oh, you have, you have too much muscle to see. And I thought, oh, that's cool. <laughs> but that's not true, because they, they, they didn't know what was going on. Point is, I ended up in the hospital for one week. But you know what? I got to tell you. That wasn't even close to as much pain as the emotional pain that I felt for three months in a cervical collar, a hard cervical collar, and watched the guy who took my place and took second place. I cried after every game. I had to be at every match to show support and I would leave and I would cry myself to sleep. That is the emotional pain that for years I didn't know why would that happen to me? Why me? Until I realized the greatest gift and that is the gift that I committed to every day of my working life to become a, a chiropractor and take care of people. Because I swore that I never wanted to see someone sit in front of me in pain and anguish and injury and not be able to participate in their passion, in their sport, in their activity. And I said to myself, you know what? I know what it feels like. I will never let anybody feel that way because I will find an answer and we will get that person better. So those things that are unfortunate to you, you would be surprised at what, there's a gift right behind it. You just have to see. And so that crazy philosophy that I thought was, if something bad happens, well, it has to be followed by something good because that's balance in life. That is not true. I'll tell you what's true. But I have five minutes left. No, no, I'm kidding. What's not true is, or what is absolute truth is what you believe. I'm not here to tell you that your way of thinking is wrong, your way of thinking is right, your way of thinking is wrong, your way of thinking. I'm here to tell you that it's really a matter of perspective and your perspective breeds power. Your ability to translate whatever is going on, no matter what it is, to translate that to personal power. Because I promise you, if you hardwire yourself, and it's, it requires sometimes mental training to rewire, re hardwire and rewire your way of thinking. And to say, you know what? I got to find the reason why this happened and why it serves me. How will it serve me? So whether you use that during a race, during an event, to go, I am going to translate that emotional pain into personal power, you figure out a way to do it. Because for every one of you, it's different. It's a different experience. Turn your pain into power. Thank you very much.